Please join me in welcoming a senator to fall in love with, Elizabeth Warren. Nancy for the very kind introduction and Nancy and I will be the only two people in this room who will believe this once you hear the rest of the speech. Nancy and I did not coordinate. Um, so just keep that in mind as we go forward through this. But what it does say is I really do want a chance to thank Nancy publicly, not only for her years in public service on the bench, but for the enormous energy she has put into service after her time on the bench, including heading up a judicial selection committee for us in Massachusetts. So thank you, Nancy, for all you did. Thank you, dear. I also want to say thank you very much to Caroline, to Peter, to everybody here at ACS for all of the hard work you do. You know, when I was at Harvard, I was always happy to attend any ACS event. I was happy to contribute to the ACS journal. I even managed to steal a few ACS students to get them to come be research assistants. So it's been terrific to have a front row seat or, well, at least a second row seat as I've watched ACS grow from the kernel of an idea into a real force. It has been wonderful to see. ACS is a force, a force that is more essential today than it has ever been. On hotly debated issues about law, about policy, conservatives are organizing themselves to put serious pressure on Congress and the courts to strip away important rights and reforms that we have fought fiercely to win. We need ACS to push back. That's what this is about. John Adams and the founders, all of the founders, were very worried about the concentration of power. And John Adams, who I now regularly quote, since he's a Massachusetts native, wrote our state constitution, um, expressed the idea well. He said, power must be opposed to power, force to force, strength to strength, interest to interest as well as reason to reason, eloquence to eloquence, passion to passion. Balance, said Adams, is critical. Here in Washington, power is not balanced. Indeed, power is becoming more concentrated on one side. There are powerful, deep-pocketed corporate interests lined up to fight to protect their privilege and to resist any change that would limit corporate excesses. I saw one of the example of this, a regular example, up close and personal, following the 2008 financial crisis, when I fought for stronger financial regulation against big banks. But there are many, many more examples. These big corporate interests are savvy. They fight every day on Capitol Hill and in the agencies devoting enormous resources to the task of bending legislation to benefit themselves. But they also devote enormous resources toward influencing the courts. Why? Because they know that influencing those who interpret the law is another extremely effective way to achieve their goals. Now, in our democracy, when we write laws Reason, debate, public opinion, political accountability are all factors that at least have a chance to thwart the powerful interests. But even if those powerful corporations lose the fight in Congress, and remember, sometimes they do lose the fight in Congress. We've got an NLRB, an EPA, and now we've got a new Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. Sometimes we get this done. But even in those cases, they can turn their defeat into their victory if they can get a favorable court opinion. Powerful corporate interests understand that if they can rig the courts, a friendly judicial system will give them 
a second bite at whatever they want. So I came here today because I had a message I wanted to bring personally. And here it is. There is an intense fight going on right now over what our federal courts will look like. It is a fight over whether those courts will remain a neutral forum, faithfully interpreting the law and dispensing impartial justice, or whether we will see corporate capture of the federal courts, with the courts transformed into one more version of the rigged game. And right now, we're losing that fight. The reasons are many. Consider the composition of the federal bench. Look at the federal bench, and you'll see a striking lack of professional diversity among the lawyers who serve as federal judges. According to a study published by ACS earlier this year, as of 2008, the federal bench was dominated, let me, this is a quote, dominated by judges whose previous professional experience is generally corporate or prosecutorial. The study examined biographies of 162 judges listed in the Almanac of the Federal Judiciary. It found that 85% of the judges had worked in private practice and also noticed that it was, and again quoting, clear from the judges' biographies that a sizable number of them work for large, well-known firms that tend to represent corporations. Meanwhile, only 3%, that's five judges, out of a total 162, had substantial legal experience working for nonprofit organizations. And none of those five had worked for such an organization since 1981. Similarly, only 3% of the judges had worked for organizations or government agencies that enforce civil rights. Only three judges in total appeared to have worked for organizations representing low-income Americans. And only one judge, one out of 162, appeared to have substantial experience litigating consumer protection cases. Now, since taking office, President Obama has been responsible for some notable exceptions to this trend. District Court Judge Edward Chen worked for many years as a staff attorney for the ACLU, and the president stood behind the Chen nomination. He renominated him three times over three years before the Senate finally agreed to confirm him. Generally, however, even the president's appointments have been in line with prior statistics. A study by the Alliance for Justice shows that the president has nominated 41 private sector lawyers to the federal appeals court while selecting only three legal aid lawyers and three public defenders. Now, I want to be clear. There are some really, really talented judges who come from the private sector. I myself have worked for private clients. And it is, of course, true that the personal views of an attorney often diverge from those of his or her clients. But I think diversity of experience really matters. At his induction ceremony, Judge Chen was quoted as saying he never considered withdrawing his name from consideration. And here was his reason. He said, I believe that someone should not be disqualified from the bench simply because they once represented the voiceless and the unpopular rather than the wealthy and the powerful. And I believe Judge Chen is right. That's right. So it's the composition, but another important reason why we are at serious risk of losing this fight is the increasingly brazen and ideologically, uh, ideological pro-corporate tilt of most of our federal courts, and especially the Supreme Court and the D.C. Circuit. Data on the Supreme Court in recent years shows a heavy pro-corporate tilt. The five conservative justices currently sitting on the Supreme Court, are you ready for this, are in the 10 most pro-business justices in half a century. And Justices Alito and Thomas are number one and number two in half a century in being pro-corporate. Or take a look at the win rate 
of the Chamber of Commerce. According to the Constitutional Accountability Center, the Chamber moved from a 43% win rate during the very conservative uh, during the very conservative Burger Court to a 56% win rate under the very conservative Rehnquist Court, and now they are at a 70% win rate under the Roberts Court. Follow this pro-business trend to its logical conclusion, and sooner or later, you will end up with a Supreme Court that functions as a wholly owned subsidiary of the Chamber of Commerce. The consequences of this pro-corporate shift are staggering, and it's not just the Affordable Care Act, which came within an inch of being invalidated by the Supreme Court, or Citizens United, which unleashed an avalanche of secret corporate money into our political system. Those cases get a lot of attention, but other cases are just as damaging. We have a Supreme Court that chose the absurd legal formalism over equal pay for equal work, forcing Congress to step in and correct their obvious error in the Lilly Ledbetter case. We have a Supreme Court that rewrote our established understanding of the standards for filing lawsuits in Iqbal and the Twombly cases, making it easier for sophisticated deep party pockets to prevail against underdogs. And we have a court that looks for every opportunity to undermine class actions, even if that means corporations can roll over millions of people. This isn't right. In addition, the Supreme Court's unique ability to pick and choose which cases it will hear gives it tremendous power to shape the evolution of the law. According to data collected and analyzed by Adam Chandler at SCOTUS blog, the most successful groups at getting the Supreme Court to take their petitions are, and I'm quoting, pro-business, anti-regulatory, and ideologically conservative. In the top 15 are some of the biggest advocates for big business. The Chamber of Commerce, number one again. The Cato Institute, the National Federation of Independent Businesses, the Pharmaceutical Industry Lobby, and the American Bankers Association. These interest groups see a Supreme Court that scholars and analysts alike have called the most pro-business court in modern history. They are kids in a candy store, kids with plenty of money to spend, bringing case after case to advance their political agenda. Then look beyond the Supreme Court to the D.C. Circuit, which hears most of the appeals of decisions. It has been called the second most important federal court in the land, and the story here is no better. Some of the most consequential decisions of our time, the decisions about whether or not Wall Street reform will have real bite or whether it's going to be toothless, are only now bubbling up through the D.C. Circuit. Swaps dealers in the security industry are trying to gut the Commodity Futures Trading Commission, rules that prevent excessive speculation on Wall Street. The Business Roundtable and the Chamber of Commerce are fighting to prevent shareholders from getting information about candidates for boards of directors. The list goes on. Auto dealers, oil companies, others, challenging the rules left and right. And the next time you hear someone claim that the D.C. Circuit doesn't need any more judges, has three vacancies right now, you can remind them that the president with the most appointees sitting on the D.C. Circuit right now is Ronald Reagan. It's been 25 years since his last appointment. Now, as lawyers and law students, we know that the D.C. Circuit must defer to agency interpretations. That's the law. It's not allowed to substitute its own judgment for that of the agencies. But that's no longer the expectation in Washington. The D.C. Circuit seems increasingly hostile toward agency rulemaking by financial regulators. And the result is that some agencies in Washington, minority commissioners are getting extra leverage in policymaking because it is increasingly believed that if the minority dissents, 
the D.C. Circuit will use that dissent as a way to swoop down and nullify the rule. We've already seen this happen. In a case called Business Roundtable versus the SEC, the D.C. Circuit struck down a rule developed under Dodd-Frank that would give shareholders more information in nominating directors for their companies. In that case, the court held the rule was arbitrary and capricious and even cited directly to the dissenting statements of the losing commissioners. So let's put these pieces together from beginning to end. Because of Citizens United, powerful interests have undue influence over elections and therefore get legislation passed. The Affordable Care Act dramatically rewrites Congress's authority to regulate under the Commerce Clause. The D.C. Circuit's aggressive approach to reviewing agency decisions means that some laws passed by Congress, in effect, will be neutered by a hostile court. And then, even if the laws get passed and the agencies make the regulations stick, decisions to restrict access to justice means that individual citizens may never be able to get in the door to exercise their rights in court. Each one of these decisions is a serious problem, but together, each magnifies the impact of the other. So, what do we do? Well, I don't kid myself. Fighting back is not easy. Powerful interests invested in the status quo, they know what's at stake. They are organized, they are effective, and they come to this battle armed with lobbyists and lawyers. We are up against a conservative movement that for 30 years since President Reagan has dedicated itself to packing the courts with pro-business, anti-regulation, conservative allies. They are tough and they are prepared. We will not win all of the fights ahead, but if we are going to have a chance we begin by speaking out about what is happening in our courts. We have to do that. We have to be willing to speak out, and we must make judicial nominations a priority. A priority. It is time for a new generation of judges, judges whose life experiences extend beyond big firms, federal prosecution, and white-collar defense. We need sustained pressure on those judges to get them in front of the United States Senate. We need pressure, pressure on our president, pressure on our senators, pressure on the press. And if the judges don't get a vote, if they are blocked, if they can't get through, then we need to change the filibuster rules to get them through. You bet. That's true. So we got a lot of different folks in here who have a lot of different interests, but I want to make this as clear as I can. If you care about the Affordable Care Act, if you care about the Voting Rights Act, if you care about financial reform, then your fight is not just a fight about policy. Your fight is not just a fight in Congress. Your fight is in the courts. Your fate is tied to judges who will decide these cases, and your fight must be to bring a new generation of judges to the bench. That's what we have to do. Yes, we do. We don't need judges who put a thumb on the scales of justice. We need judges who will be fair, judges who will be even-handed, and judges who will have the experience to consider all sides to an issue. That's what we need. So. This is it. I love coming here. I love being with ASA, ACS, but I, got, but I got to say this. I always come here to ask you to fight. This is going to be a hard fight. There will be many battles ahead, but I truly believe 
and what we can do together. There are people in this room and lawyers all across the country who are active in ACS. They are tough, resourceful, and creative. Together, we can get a new generation of judges on the bench, and we can prevent the corporate capture of the federal courts. Thank you for having me here tonight. Let's go fight. Too bad. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.